200 years ago, a strange new medicine was invented. It was called homeopathy. And despite all the advances of modern medicine, homeopathy still survives today. That is surprising because its central principle is diametrically opposed to that of established medical science. Homeopathy believes that the more a drug is diluted, the more powerful and beneficial a treatment it becomes. In order to work, the drug must be repeatedly diluted and shaken in a special way. It's a belief system that sounds more like arcane ritual magic than modern rational medicine. And yet today, in the late 20th century, homeopathy is becoming more and more popular, not just with the general public, but among doctors too. So which is it, medicine or magic? In Britain, alternative medicine seems to be booming, offering a variety of treatments and potions unheard of in conventional medicine. Homeopathic remedies are particularly in demand, suggesting homeopathy has a special appeal. Homeopathy is the most popular and well-known of all the alternative forms of medicine. It is, in fact, the only alternative form of medicine available on the NHS. It has a long tradition of uh, medical practice attached to it, and there are over 500 fully qualified doctors, plus five NHS hospitals operating in the country. Therefore, I think homeopathy has a much higher profile than many of the other alternative medicines. Also, the royal patronage, without doubt, does help homeopathy to raise its profile and to give it a seal of approval. The royals are big fans. The Queen Mother, Prince Charles, and the Queen herself have each given royal warrants to firms of homeopathic chemists. And when medicine was nationalized in 1948, the royal patronage was crucial in ensuring homeopathy became part of the NHS. Today, there remain a handful of homeopathic hospitals which have doggedly survived attempts to axe them and where you can still get treatment on the NHS. Like any other NHS hospital, they have qualified nurses and properly qualified doctors. And they did very well to begin with. So Every very, doctor very well. is fully trained in conventional and medicine and has then taken up homeopathy. Mm -hmm. A consultation at first appears like any other. So it's arthritis. But quite soon, the similarities with orthodox medicine begin to disappear. Are you, a, are you a sensitive person? Are you intuitive? Can you read people's minds? I know that's a difficult question, but um, are you a warrior, for instance? Are you a big warrior? No. Are you a neat person? Are you very tidy and meticulous and precise? Yes. Very? Organized. A strong-willed person, would you say? Yes. In diagnosing the patient's illness and deciding on treatment, personality can be as important as the disease itself. With hundreds of possible remedies to choose from, the doctor tries to match up all the aspects of a patient's illness with the particular homeopathic drug that's been found over the years to work best for people with his very specific symptoms and personality. So, unlike conventional medicine, people with the same disease may often not get the same treatment. We'll start you off with a homeopathic remedy, which is really some of the main symptoms that you brought up, all right? Um, for example, the wind and the, the bloating, the not so good in the middle of the afternoon so as a general feature. And also the rather odd symptom which you brought up, of feeling something alive inside the abdomen. But the biggest difference from conventional medicine is with the homeopathic remedies themselves. Unlike most normal drugs, they are made mainly from plants or minerals. There's no chemical processing, the whole plant extract is used. And millions of medicines can be made from just one drop. Homeopaths claim that gradually diluting the extract in stages will make it more potent, providing every time it's diluted, it's succussed. Each stage of dilution involves adding one drop to a hundred drops of a water-alcohol mixture. It was an 18th century German physician, Samuel Hahnemann, who first laid down the principles of homeopathy. He said that a disease can be cured by giving a substance that produces similar symptoms to the disease itself. He called it curing like with like. 
He also claimed to find, apparently by accident, that diluting and shaking the substance makes it safer and more powerful. But as each stage, called a potency, makes the mixture a hundred times more dilute than before, the levels of dilution quickly become astronomical. After only three stages, it's a million times more dilute. But homeopathic doctors might prescribe anything up to a thousand stages of dilution, normally in the form of pills. To a bottle of sugar pills will be added just a drop or two of the final dilution. And that's the medicine. In the real world of normal physics and chemistry, it's hardly surprising most doctors and scientists regard much of homeopathy as completely absurd. One of the basic principles of homeopathy is simply that the less you give of a drug, the bigger effect that it has. And this is really rather like saying the less whiskey you drink, the more drunk you get. Um, everybody knows that that's not true. And one really doesn't have to have any sort of scientific subtlety to realize that it's not true. It's counter to ordinary, everyday experience. Now, this is really very easily illustrated by just considering the sort of dilutions that are used in homeopathic remedies. There's a quite a commonly used dilution, 24C, so-called. What that means is that you make a hundred-fold dilution of the drug, and then you repeat that, and you repeat it another 24 times. And that means you've diluted the drug out by a factor of a million, 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 million <laughs> fold. So there's not very much of the drug left. In fact, there's none of the drug left whatsoever. In order to get even one single molecule of the drug, when the dilution is like that, you would have to take a pill which was the size of the whole planet Earth just to get one molecule. Now, that is really very hard to swallow. And yet, more and more people seem to think homeopathy works. Just one pill you're three times a day. Last year, an estimated eight million Britons took homeopathic remedies and had over a million consultations, some of them apparently successful, as for this patient with severe rheumatoid arthritis. I saw an immediate improvement within a couple of months. Um, so it was, very, it was a very dramatic thing that um, conventional medicine certainly couldn't help me at all, and homeopathy did. Uh, he was asthmatic and he was uh, not very well. And I took him to the doctor and the drugs that he was getting were making him rather dopey. So I thought there's got to be another way and I tried homeopathy. And it's worked, it's been brilliant for him. I wouldn't practice homeopathy if I wasn't convinced, if I hadn't been convinced by my own personal experiences over many years that these things do have effects. I, I know what, you know, I'm, I'm conventionally trained in medicine. I know what you can achieve with conventional drugs. And I've seen homeopathy do things that I'm sure one couldn't have done by any other means. And that is giving you less Sometimes there that appear that to be spectacular that cures. I started treatment last Wednesday, and by Saturday night I could move my foot that I haven't been able to move for at least nine years. Uh, I just can't believe it. I feel fantastic. Uh, you know, it's a miracle. But miracles aren't proof. And the official view is that homeopathy only works as a placebo effect. Any cures being due to suggestion. It's all in the mind. Basically, we were unable to find any evidence to support uh, the view that homeopathy offers anything uh, to uh, patients other than uh, it will help uh, from a psychological and possibly even a psychiatric point of view. Uh, uh, patients need a shoulder to cry on, and the uh, homeopathic physician provides that. Whether his medicines do any good or not is another matter. The medical establishment having dismissed homeopathy, it takes courage to investigate it within its very walls. But that's just what one young doctor at Glasgow's prestigious Royal Infirmary has done. David Riley, like other doctors, has been aware of the growth of alternative medicine and out of sheer scientific curiosity felt he had to discover why some of it appeared to work. It seemed to me that homeopathy presented really the greatest scientific challenge. Um, within our thought structure, it seems completely implausible. Uh, and yet the worldwide demand and the patient experiences seem so dramatic and persistent across time that I felt it was a puzzle that really had to be solved. So I decided to investigate this strange therapy and one of the aspects I looked at was the historical background. 
I was quite stunned. The system had been developed in a progressive manner for approaching 200 years. I found medical journals published in continuity for a century and a half. I found many apparently learned and skilled physicians writing up case histories reporting success and serious life-threatening infections. And leafing through one of these textbooks, I realized if 5% of this is true, the implications are absolutely stunning for the population and for medicine itself. Nevertheless, I'm, I came to the conclusion, I must be honest, the biased conclusion that I was looking at one of the most fascinating structures built around suggestion and goodwill and naivety that the medical world had perhaps ever seen. But he decided to put homeopathy to the test on hay fever. A standard treatment for hay fever, in fact, uses a homeopathic principle that like cures like. Conventional doctors tried to cure hay fever by injecting grass pollen to build up immunity. Homeopaths use the same idea, but in pill form and in infinitesimal amounts. Homeopaths claim that if you dilute this pollen in a particular way, it continues to be active at levels which we would say are impossible, beyond Avogadro's numbers, as in technical language, uh, really ridiculous levels of dilution. So although uh, hay fever was the disease, the issue was these so-called potencies or extreme dilutions. These two bottles here contain the medicines. So in 1983, Dr. Riley tested two bottles of identical pills on over 30 hay fever sufferers. Unknown to them, only one of the bottles had been dosed with a few drops of the homeopathic remedy. The other contained just dummy pills. You'll fill out uh, this line as I described a visual analog scale that will score just how bad the hay fever has been that day. His volunteers were asked to keep a daily record of their hay fever symptoms while taking first one bottle and then the other. Dr. Riley fully expected his trial to prove that any benefit from the homeopathic remedy would be due to a placebo effect, that it was all in the mind. <coughs> but the study showed that remedy worked. Unfortunately for me and my thinking at that time, it yielded a positive result, a statistically significant positive result. So I took the attitude, something has gone wrong here. This is impossible. And I said, let's rerun this study. So all, all and any criticism that was offered was incorporated in rerunning the study. And it was run in the year later on a much grander scale, five times more patients, and all sorts of inbuilt measures against bias or fraud or any other possible explanation. Every diary was examined by an independent assessor from the University Department of Medicine who verified the data against the computer printout. He signed this, put, placed it in a sealed envelope and delivered it to the statistician. He checked this paper against the disk he'd received and analyzed the results triple blind, as is known in the trade. He didn't know which group was which. The result was a surprise. Again, the homeopathic medicine demonstrated itself as being greater in effect than the dummy medicine. In fact, the homeopathic remedy was 15% better and indeed quite as good as many conventional hay fever treatments. So does that prove homeopathy works? It's completely artificial to expect one trial to prove or disprove such an important controversy. One looks across a broad spectrum of activity and see if the critical mass of evidence is moving towards a resolution of this problem. Christopher Day is a homeopathic vet. He's a leading figure among a growing number of British vets who have turned to homeopathy, and his experience with it provides another important piece of evidence. Although conventionally trained, over the years he has come to reject conventional drugs and now relies mainly on homeopathy. I qualified in 1972 from Cambridge University, and after a few weeks in practice, I was tempted to try some homeopathic remedies on some chronic cases. And I found to my surprise that a percentage of them were responding in a way which I never thought was possible before. And from then on, really, it's been a slippery slope. I'm afraid I've gone on deeper and deeper. Oh, Gunny. All right. All right. We've obviously got to try and stimulate that nerve to heal and reduce the bruising around it. And uh, that way she'll have a chance. Broadly speaking, the advantage of homeopathy is the lack of side effects. 
in that, uh, especially in the case of chronic disease, where you can envisage long-term treatment with drugs, which even with the mild drugs will produce side effects, with homeopathy we are free of that danger. So we're talking about a, a tremendously safe system of medicine. And all that it requires is to know that it's effective before it becomes correct to use it. And we've certainly proved the effect in chronic cases here. And this is Kim. As with humans, homeopathic that, um, diagnosis for animals that. includes personality. Do you feel that she is much happier anyway in the cool? In the cool, yeah. She is herself. Does she have any fears? People? No. Are the dogs doesn't. all right? Yes. For the last five years, Kim has had a skin condition which conventional vets have been unable to clear up with drugs. And in desperation, Kim's owner has come to Christopher Day for help. She's very good, isn't she? No, she is. I don't think she's really enjoying this. This particular case is very typical of many of the skin problems we see. And it has been on steroid for quite a long time with diminishing effect. And it is still self-mutilating. It is still scratching and biting has these tremendous sores on the back and has lost a lot of hair. And what we intend to give it is sulfur because this remedy in fact fits most closely the picture that's presented by this dog in terms of its character and its likes and dislikes and the skin lesions that we're seeing. And I've chosen the 200th centesimal potency, the 200C, because I feel that this will suit the case best in the power that it will give. And this is the remedy diluted one in 100, 200 times. So we're talking about a remedy, well, sub-molecular. And I anticipate it would have quite a beneficial effect on the case. Three months later, Kim was brought back for a checkup by a grateful owner. There's a good girl. Pretty. Shall we turn around the light a minute and see her a little bit better around there? For the first time in years, the skin problem looked considerably improved. Now, how's she been? Well, as regards the general condition of coat, she's 100% better than when we had her before. And just up here, it seems to have cleared up tremendously well, doesn't it? Animals are meant to be less suggestible than humans. So do successful cases like this mean that homeopathy might not be all in the mind? I think the sceptics will often level the argument that the apparent healing effects of homeopathy will be down to a, a mental process, that it's all in the mind. And this so-called placebo effect is a word that's often used. And where you could imagine perhaps a small amount of this occurring in a, an owner-pet bonding relationship, I fail to see how, when the large proportion of my work is done on farm animals, large herds of farm animals, dosed via their drinking water, how we are going to convince them that they're going to be healed and therefore have a mental process that's healing them. I fail to see how that can be all in the mind. Like most country vets, Christopher Day has to survive in the hard commercial world of the farm where sick animals cost money. A major loss for milk producers is an infection of the udder called mastitis. As Day became more confident with homeopathy, he decided to offer farmers a new mastitis treatment. He told them they could help prevent mastitis by adding a few milliliters of a homeopathic remedy to their cow's water supply just once a month. I was very, very skeptical. When he told me it was just a matter of putting a few drops of water into a trough, I thought, how on earth can it work? But um, actually doing it has proven to me that it is very successful. Um, the savings on the herd is incredible. Just by putting five milliliters of water, as it looks like, into the water trough once a month, is saving me a thousand pounds a year. So that has convinced me. I'm not skeptical anymore. The new homeopathic treatment for Peter Reed's cows has saved him that much money because the normal treatment for mastitis ends up being pretty expensive. Vets normally prescribe antibiotics, which must be repeatedly injected into the udder until the infection clears up. The reason the orthodox treatment is so costly is that for days afterwards, the cow's milk must be thrown away because of the antibiotic residues. But these days, for Peter Reed, that problem is rare. Before we used homeopathic treatments, we were getting about 30 to 40 cases of mastitis, clinical cases of mastitis, every year. Since we've been using homeopathic treatments and remedies, we are down to as low as six a year now, which is very rare that we get a case. It, we can always put it down to a cow having a blow from another cow, either being kicked or bunted in the other, never from just a normal clinical case. Cattle on other farms have also been getting Christopher Day's homeopathic treatments. Again, it seems, with good results. 
We've been using uh, homeopathic medicine for about six years on the farm here now and gradually increasing it over that time. Uh, we find it very effective in many cases. Not totally effective, but uh, in many cases very effective. In, in some problems that we have on the farm, we have a disease called New Forest Eye, which is a disease of the eye that cattle get. And there I would describe it to, as a miracle cure, no doubt about it. With New Forest Eye in cattle, and if you look at the, the cows here, the conventional treatment would be shots of antibiotic underneath the eyelid every day for four or five days. Now, those animals would have to be caught, held, and injected. And they're big animals, and in some cases, you could be talking about 30 or 40 animals a day. Now, with the homeopathic treatment, it's a case of a few drops of these homeopathic remedies in the water trough daily, and that will cure this problem within three or four days. It is a miracle. Chris Day's experience with a number of local farmers like John Gearing has finally convinced him. We found that administering remedies in the water does have a profound effect on chronic diseases within a herd. At what dilution? Again, a 30th centesimal dilution. So, which is 1 in 130 times, or 10 to the minus 60, to give you its mathematical way. So, it's effectively, you're still giving water? We're still giving submolecular concentrations, quantities, call them what you like, of the remedy, yes. In the water supply? In the water supply, so it's already then being diluted again, <laughs> which is fairly mind-boggling. But I mean, it can be diluted several hundred times again, which is infinitesimal amount compared to what it's already been through. And it appears very effective, and this is very, very repeatable. We have actually done one trial, uh, which we monitored very, very closely in a dairy herd to see the effects of homeopathy on mastitis. And we split the herd into two groups of 40 cows. And we supplied the farmer with two bottles. One was a, an unmedicated solvent, and the other bottle contained homeopathic treatment. One was labeled A and one was labeled B. So there was no way the farmer knew which bottle was which, which side of the herd, if you like, he was treating, and which side he was just giving solvent to. And we went through the whole winter with him administering small quantities to the water troughs of each side. You know, one side was getting A and one side was getting B throughout the winter. We monitored mastitis occurrences, we monitored the difficulty of curing it, and we monitored all the mastitis parameters within the herd. And what we found that she was most startling in this particular herd, we found one case only of mastitis in the treated herd and 19 cases in the untreated side and that was 19 out of 40, so we're talking about a 50% incidence on one side and one in 40 on the other side. But how can it possibly work? No one seems to be able to explain why it works. I think this is a big problem. I have no problem personally because I've seen it working. And when you remove yourself from the problem of molecules being the only thing that do anything and think more about energies, then the thing starts to make a lot more sense and you can understand a concept that in producing an energetic change in the body, the body can then get on and heal itself. But how can the chemical energy and information in a substance continue to survive repeated dilutions? One theory to explain homeopathy says that the water the substance is diluted in may somehow have a memory of the original substance. It may be that contained within the water is some form of biophysical imprint. Let me, let me give you a model for this. Water is one substance in one concentration, and yet it can take many forms. Water truly is a strange substance. In particular, if you think of snowflakes, one substance in one biochemical concentration, absolutely identical, and yet showing an infinite capacity for variation and form. Every snowflake is unique. Every one of the countless millions of snowflakes and the pattern and the field which maintains that pattern is unique. And so we have an infinite capacity for informational structure within a biochemically identical substance. And so really we're asking, is bio biological information encoded within these solutions, within these water solutions? But the theory is far too revolutionary to be contemplated by orthodox science. The principle that 
the memory of the molecules resides in the water, and that memory lasts a long time and communicates itself to the patient even months after the dilutions were made. That is a different sort of claim in a way because it's really quite contrary to all we know about physics. And it's in order to believe that sort of claim, then you would have to overturn a large part of physics as we know it at the moment, and a large part of pharmacology too, but as a consequence. Now, one can certainly say that physics has been overturned before. No science is immutable, and uh, it is absolutely true that physics has been overturned many times. But it's only overturned when there is a very good reason to do so. The fact is that because the medical establishment thinks homeopathy so implausible, very few convincing clinical trials have been done, and so there's little evidence. But things are beginning to change. A high-powered team at Bart's Hospital in London recently organized a proper double-blind clinical trial of homeopathy on fibrocytis. So it's a little tender there, is that yeah. right? Um, it's a condition orthodox medicine finds hard to treat, but this preliminary study showed homeopathy did provide some benefit. Elsewhere, at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, a similar trial is underway on asthma. Right in, right in, right in, right in, blow pass, push. Here, four right academic up, right departments up, right have been running a full-scale double-blind evaluation of an extremely dilute homeopathic remedy. And the indications are it too has been successful. But much more research is needed. The scientific community and the medical community cannot turn its back on this controversy. We have to open the doors of our academic establishments and open the minds of our academics uh, to examine this issue. I think that's what the public understands by science. And I think the scientific community must respond to that need. Meanwhile, the foot soldiers of medicine have already stolen a march on the academics. At the homeopathic hospitals, courses in homeopathy are now being offered to people in the front line of orthodox medicine, Britain's general practitioners. And they're becoming increasingly popular. These doctors seem unconcerned that homeopathy cannot work. They simply ask, does it work? And is it better than conventional medicine? It certainly does much less harm than most of the drugs we prescribe. And I would suggest that a, a good a doctor might be one who does uh, as Hippocrates said originally, uh, more good than harm. And I think there are many doc many of us who do more harm, more harm than good. No one system can solve all problems all the time. Regular medicine solves many problems up to an extent or doesn't deal with very small ones or chronic ones. Homeopathy deals with that and uh, has solved many of them. Well, sometimes you actually use it in children who don't know what they're having and they improve amazingly fast, much quicker than giving them an antibiotic, for instance. Similarly, in people who are perhaps comatose, they have no idea that they're being given a med medication and they do improve. So the skeptics that say it doesn't work, then they must see that the results prove that it does. So is homeopathy magic or medicine? For a small but increasing number of doctors, it seems it's a bit of both. I've no idea why it works, um, but it does seem to work. And uh, I think if it works, you should try it. So it's been